Welcome to Death Row. Back from it. You believe in God? Certainly. Believe in Death Row East. <laughs> believe in that. For real. Do my own That's boy it. Say, right I'm gonna ride with you. Believe in God. Believe in Death Row East. The origins of Death Row Records trace back to Suge Knight, who was born and raised in Compton, California. Growing up in an environment marked by gang violence, he stood out as one of the greatest artists of all time, even though he never directly admitted his affiliations. Suge often wore the red colors of the Bloods, who dominated his neighborhood, but he was never an official gang member. Before his transition to the music industry, Suge was an aspiring professional football player. After his athletic career at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, Suge played briefly for the Los Angeles Rams, but his football career ended. He found work as a bodyguard and became the full-time bodyguard for R&B icon Bobby Brown, thus starting to make important connections in the music industry. Suge entered the music business with a publishing company in 1989. While working as Bobby Brown's bodyguard, Suge met Dr. Dre, who at the time felt underpaid for his role at Ruthless Records and was looking for a way out. Suge, college educated, was smart and imposing, doing the impossible to get what he wanted. He managed to release Dre from his contract with Ruthless in an intimidating manner, but not in the way depicted in the NWA movie, where Easy e is beaten up, which is false. According to an interview with Biggie Knockout, Dre called Easy e to discuss contracts and other matters. When Easy e arrived, Dre was not present. Instead, Suge and some enforcers intimidated him into signing, but without physical violence. This way, Dre was released from Ruthless. Besides Dre's contract, Suge also obtained the contracts of the DOC and Michelle Liu. Suge and Dr. Dre, along with partners the DOC and Dick Griffey, started creating a new record label. Dick Griffey was a producer and music promoter from Los Angeles and owner of Solar Records, offering Dre his facilities and a studio in Hollywood to work in. The new label was initially called Future Shock, then Death Row, but in 1992, the final name became Death Row Records. To finance such a large project, Suge Knight contacted Michael Harris, a drug dealer imprisoned on drug charges and attempted murder. Through Harris's attorney, David Kenner, Harris created Godfather Entertainment, a parent company for the newly named Death Row Records. Suge also secured a large sum of money by visiting Vanilla Ice at his apartment, claiming that Mario Chocolate Johnson had produced and co-written the song Ice, Ice Baby without receiving royalties. Suge insinuated to Vanilla Ice that he would throw him from the 15th floor if he didn't give up the rights to the song, allowing Suge to finance Death Row. Suge Knight began signing young artists from California, and Death Row's first project was the soundtrack for the 1992 movie Deep Cover. The title track, Deep Cover, launched Dr. Dre as a solo artist, with the young Snoop Dogg as his protege. In December 1992, Dr. Dre released his first album, The Chronic. The Chronic exploded in the United States and worldwide, reaching number 3 on the Billboard 200 and earning triple platinum certification with 3 million copies sold in the United States. This made Dr. Dre one of the best-selling artists in the U.S. and one of the most talented hip-hop producers in the industry. The Chronic became an instant rap classic. Death Row's first album remained in the top 10 on the Billboard for eight consecutive months, proving that gangster rap was a highly profitable product. Although The Chronic was a solo album, it featured many appearances by the then-emerging rapper Snoop Doggy Dogg. The song Nothing But a G-Tang was even nominated for a Grammy. At the time, Death Row's roster included Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, Daz Dillinger, Corrupt, Nate Dogg, Lady of Rage, The Dog Pound, RBX, among others. After the success of The Chronic, Dr. Dre began working on Snoop Dogg's debut album. The album, called Doggy Style, was released in November 1993 and surpassed The Chronic. The album sold over 4 million copies and debuted at number 1 on the Billboard Top 10. Additionally, it was certified 4 times platinum. The song Gin and Juice was also nominated for a Grammy. Alongside The Chronic, the distinctive sounds of Doggy Style helped introduce the hip-hop subgenre G-Funk to a wider audience, presenting West Coast rap as a dominant force. In 1994, Death Row released the Above the Rim soundtrack for the movie of the same name. 
It received critical acclaim and was a commercial success, a rare feat for soundtracks. It included the hit Regulate by Warren G. and Nate Dogg, which was nominated for a Grammy. But while Death Row dominated the West Coast, there was a label that dominated the East Coast, Bad Boy Records, and soon war would erupt. In 1995, after a visit from Suge Knight to Tupac at the Clinton Correctional Facility in upstate New York, Suge traveled south to join the Death Row crew at the second annual Source Awards. At the Source Awards in August 1995, Suge Knight openly criticized Diddy for appearing on his artists' songs and dancing in their videos. Suge Knight told the audience, any artist out there who wants to be an artist and stay a star, and don't want to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the videos, all on the records, dancing, come to death row. He also made a comment in support of Tupac. By 1995, Death Row had become a dominant label in hip-hop as gangster rap became the most popular and marketable form of contemporary music in the United States. After Suge's statements against Diddy, the rivalry between the labels and Coasts exploded instantly. On September 24, 1995, at a party in Atlanta at a nightclub, a group from Bad Boy got into a heated argument with Suge and his friend Big Jake a member of the Bloods gang and a death row security guard. According to witnesses, Diddy argued heatedly with Suge inside the club, and a few minutes later, outside the club, a bodyguard of Diddy pointed a gun at Big Jake, who was fatally shot while getting into Suge's car. Diddy's lawyers and his bodyguard denied any involvement of their clients, claiming that Diddy wasn't even with his bodyguards that night. However, Suge immediately blamed Diddy, escalating the animosity between the two moguls, whose record labels dominated rap. Amidst this rivalry, the duo Dog Pound made their debut and released Dog Food. The album was a commercial success, reaching number one on the Billboard 200 chart. The album sold 278,000 copies in its first week. In the song New York, New York, Snoop Dogg is seen knocking down New York buildings, further fueling the East Coast-West Coast War. In October 1995, Suge Knight visited Tupac again in prison and paid a $1.4 million bail for him to sign with Death Row. Tupac accused Biggie and Diddy of the attack he suffered at Quad Studios in November 1994. As soon as he was released from prison, Tupac began working on his debut album with Death Row. The album, finally released on February 13, 1996, was titled All Eyes On Me. This album made history as the first double hip-hop album. It debuted at number one on the Billboard 200, selling 566,000 copies in its first week alone. Upon its release, it received instant critical acclaim and was certified multiple times platinum. The album features a more aggressive Tupac than in his previous albums, where he attacks his enemies and emphasizes the betrayal of friends. The songs of All Eyes On Me are generally celebrations of living Tupac's lifestyle. But Tupac's fury did not stop there. In June 1996, he released the song Hit Em Up, mainly directed at Biggie and Diddy, where Tupac brutally insults Biggie throughout. The track is a sharp response to Biggie's track, released a few months after the Quad Studios shooting incident, and even without directly mentioning Tupac's name, he believed it was aimed at him. If the situation was already tense between the coasts, hit him up further ignited the rivalry. Disillusioned with Death Row's direction, artists began to leave, including RBX and Dr. Dre, which made Suge Knight exert stricter control over the remaining ones. Dr. Dre had reduced his involvement in Death Row and also grew tired of Suge's violence within the label. Additionally, despite all the money the label was making, little was coming back to the artists. Even Dr. Dre, the creative force behind the label, was not receiving his share, and the label was full of gangsters and Suge Knight's circle. Tupac's behavior became erratic as he continued his feuds with Biggie, Bad Boy Records, and other East Coast rappers. Finally, due to internal struggles, Dr. Dre officially left Death Row Records to start his own label, which provoked Tupac's anger against him. In an act of expansion, Death Row planned to create Death Row East, an East Coast branch. On September 4, 1996, Tupac was looking to the future with Death Row East, along with Suge and his followers promoting this expansion. Unfortunately, Death Row East would not become a reality. 
On the night of September 7, 1996, Tupac attended a Mike Tyson fight in Las Vegas, Nevada. That night, Suge Knight and Tupac were captured by a surveillance camera at the MGM Grand Hotel in Las Vegas, attacking Orlando Anderson, a member of the Southside Compton Crips gang. Later that night, Tupac was shot four times in a drive-by shooting while sitting in the front seat of Suge Knight's BMW, which was waiting at a traffic light. Tupac spent days in critical condition and was declared dead on September 13, 1996. Tupac's death was a pivotal moment for Death Row Records. Despite this, 1996 could end well for the label. After Tupac's death, his posthumous album, which he had been working on, The Don Kilimanati, The Seven Day Theory, was released on November 5, 1996. The album reached number one on the Billboard 200 and sold 664,000 copies in its first week of release. It also made Tupac the first rapper to have two number one albums in the same year. A week later, Snoop Dogg released his second album, The Dogfather. The album was a commercial success, debuting at number one, but it failed to match the commercial success of Doggy Style. Both The Don Kilimanati and The Dogfather achieved multi-platinum sales, ending 1996 on a positive note despite Tupac's death. But 1997 would mark the decline of Death Row Records. On February 28, 1997, Suge Knight was found guilty of violating probation and sentenced to nine years in prison. The Las Vegas fight, captured on video, was used to charge Suge with violating probation. Suge's imprisonment led Interscope, which had a distribution deal with the label, to cancel its contract. Immediately, Suge Knight's control over the label diminished, leading the remaining artists to decide to leave, including Nate Dogg, Snoop Dogg, Daz Dillinger, and The Lady of Rage. Suge Knight maintained artistic control of the label from behind bars, where he began launching smear campaigns against artists like Snoop Dogg. During this period, the label survived with several posthumous Tupac albums, compilations, and re-releases of Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. Suge attempted to revive the label by signing new talent and even renamed it The Row, but he was unsuccessful. In 2003, he was again sent to prison for violating probation by shooting a valet. The Row's earnings further dwindled during Suge's continuous incarceration. In 2005, Michael Harris and his wife Lydia sued Suge Knight, claiming they helped start the record empire and were owed $107 million in royalties. The judge agreed and authorized the claim. The following year, Suge declared bankruptcy and informed creditors that his bank account had only $11. Suge Knight ultimately lost control of Death Row Records. Since then, the label has been auctioned and acquired by different companies over the years, including the toy company Hasbro. It wasn't until 2022 that it was acquired by one of the label's most iconic artists, Snoop Dogg. In February 2022, before the release of his latest album and his appearance at the Super Bowl halftime show, Snoop Dogg announced he would acquire the rights to Death Row Records. This could mean the rebirth of an iconic label that made hip-hop history, but perhaps not, as Snoop said he wants to turn Death Row into an NFT label and be the first to have a label in the metaverse. We can only wait to see what the future holds for Death Row Records and Snoop Dogg's hands. Don't forget to leave a like to support the channel, subscribe so you don't miss any content. See you in the next video.